Welcome to uh, World Elephant Day celebration from Wildlife SOS. My name is Karthik Satyanarayan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Wildlife SOS. Before we proceed uh, this evening, uh, just a few housekeeping rules. I'd request everybody to please keep their mics muted and your video switched off. It would help us ensure that your webinar experience is of top quality if you kept all your mics muted and your video switched off. If you have any questions at all, please use the chat box to type in your question and attach your email address. Put your email address right next to the question. In case we are unable to respond to your question during the webinar, we will make sure that a response is sent to you by email. And if you have any uh, comments at all, feel free to use the chat box. We have a eight member team from Wildlife SOS who are in the chat box as I'm speaking, who will keep giving you information, clarification and responses as we proceed. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today on a very monumental day, the World Elephant Day. And I'm going to briefly give you a, a presentation on protection of elephants in India. And I hope it helps spread awareness. And uh, once again, thank you for joining me. I'm just going to share my screen. Here we go. Uh, first of all, I'd like to tell you all that um, today's presentation uh, is hosted in association with National Geographic Wild, also known as Nat Geo Wild, and Jeep, who are both uh, collaborators of Wildlife SOS and have been supporting our efforts extensively. A very brief introduction to both of those associations, Nat Geo Wild, as all of you know, you probably watch them all the time. They're a great channel to watch and have recently uh, premiered a six episode series of the work of Wildlife SOS. The program is called India's Jungle Heroes and is available on Nat Geo Wild on the channel, also on National Geographic. But you can see the entire six episodes at one go on Disney Hotstar. So please don't hesitate to go in. Our team on the chat box will give you the link to the Hotstar episodes. Jeep, again, on the other hand, as you know, is a monumental brand. It's one of the oldest brands of automobiles and also very reliable brand. Personally, one of my favorite ones as well. Uh, they've donated two vehicles to Wildlife SOS to help us with rescue and rehabilitation efforts of Wildlife SOS. And I'm grateful to both Jeep and National Geographic Wild for being a part of this very important day for us. Moving on, I'd like to introduce you very briefly to Wildlife SOS. Wildlife SOS, as you know, is a nonprofit charitable organization. It's a social enterprise and we work in partnership with local indigenous communities and of course the government of both India and the state governments of every state across India to help make a difference and give back to nature. A little bit of background about Wildlife SOS. You know, we started uh, the organization in 1995. This was created by me and another co-founder called Geeta Seshamani. And she's very shy and so she insisted that I take the photos out, otherwise you would have been able to meet her or see her. But our work started with dancing bears. And this image that you can see on your screen is of bears that were used for performances. And these were wild bears that were captured from the forest and brutalized so they could be trained to perform on the streets. So wildlife officers worked from 1995 onwards with the government of India, the state governments, the local community, which was called the Kalandar community. And we partnered with all of them together and brought an end to this practice of bear dancing, which was both illegal and brutal. But we did not do it just through law enforcement. What we did was we worked with the community. We 
did a survey, understood what their needs were, and made sure that we were able to find them alternative livelihoods that were humane in nature and did not require exploitation of animals. At the same time, we were also able to help them with women empowerment, children's education. We sent over 7,600 children to school in the community, helped 3,000 families, and by empowering the women, sending the children to school, uh, helping them with education, that made a huge difference. And we were able to successfully, over a 17 year period, bring this practice to an end. And about 40% of the workforce at Wildlife SOS is from this community. So we employ uh, young members of this community who want another form of livelihood. And we've been able to uh, use them in our team and they're valuable members of our team and now are both compassionate and kind. This success with the dancing bears is what gave us the confidence to take on elephants. And now moving on to elephants, you know, as you, as you all know, elephants have been an inescapable part of our history, culture, mythology, and, and everything and tradition in India. We all, a lot of us believe in Lord Ganesha and we pray to him as well. And he's, the whole world knows about Lord Ganesha uh, being the elephant god. I'd like to draw your attention to the photo on the left that you're seeing. You see this little child is getting blessed at a temple by an elephant. But I'd like to draw your attention to the man sitting on the right side of the front right leg of the elephant. And in his left hand, what you see is an ankush or a bullhook. And that ankush or a bullhook is what is poking the elephant and preventing the elephant from doing anything natural. And that is how elephants are controlled in India. And I think that's something that many people don't often realize. And I'm going to use this opportunity to give you all a few facts about elephants in India and what it takes to protect them and what is required to protect elephants in India. Elephants, as you know, modify our habitats and they change the forest they live in. They are literally architects of the forest because what they, they eat so much every single day that they destroy a lot of vegetation, but it also gives the vegetation an opportunity to come back, which is why elephants are on the move all the time. They move from one place to another, constantly feeding as they move. And they use these corridors between different forest patches and different ranges to move on. So by the time they eventually come back to that same area, the forest has had an opportunity to regenerate but elephants also perform a very important dispersal mechanism because they eat a lot of fruits, seeds, and all kinds of vegetation. And when they move along with their dung, they are dispersing seeds and valuable vegetation around. So it helps the forest stay alive and uh, stay healthy. Now, this is a, probably a shocking thing for many of you. Do you know India is the last stronghold for the wild Asian elephant. India has 50% of the world's Asian elephants population, but that is an abysmal 27,000 only today. That means if you look at the population about 10 decades ago, it was a million elephants. That means we've lost almost 98% of our elephants in India. And that of course is happening because we've also lost a lot of forest cover, habitat destruction, habitat defragmentation, as well as um, disturbance, including encroachment, is taking away valuable landscape that the elephants need to survive. And this is also putting them cheek to jowl with human populations, making it a, a problem because this is how human and elephants get into conflict. So this is another problem as well. Now, one thing that all of us need to understand is that how do, how do elephants, wild, which are wild animals found in the forest, how are they coming into captivity? How are they performing on streets and in circuses, temples, and giving tourists rides in different cities? It's not possible for 
wild elephants that have been subjected to a great amount of torture in captivity to have the ability to get pregnant and have two year gestation periods because they're all working elephants. So the quickest and the most lucrative way for elephant traffickers to supply trained elephants for the purpose of tourism and other such things, circuses, etc., is to harvest young elephants from the wild. And what you see here is an image of a elephant calf that's been captured in the wild. I would have loved to show you videos of how elephants are captured, but I thought I'd spare you all the trauma of watching it. But you can watch those videos on the Wildlife SOS YouTube channel if you want. But once a wild elephant is captured, this is how they are trained for tourist rides and for performing in circuses as well as street begging, etc. The image on the left is a training kraal made with wooden logs where the elephant is tied up really tightly and constrained and starved for days and beaten constantly, as you see in the right photo, which is a brutal training process. And this is the same process that's followed in India, South Asia, Southeast Asia, because to make a wild elephant or a wild animal lose its wild instinct and perform unnatural acts, such as giving people rides on its back, will, ex will involve a substantial fear and intimidation and pain. And that's the only way you can, you can uh, make a wild animal perform unnatural acts. And this is what future holds for a captive elephant once it's trained. They are then used in cities, giving people rights. And these are tourist elephants that you see in some of our cities in India. And again, this photo shows you a row of bull elephants or big tuskers standing in a row next to each other, beautifully decorated in a ceremony, in a festival in Kerala. And what you see in front are thousands of people standing there milling around these elephants. And what do you think is preventing these testosterone packed animals from running amok, getting scared, getting frazzled by this crowd and the noise? You can imagine the noise in a place like this and rampaging through the crowd, killing or injuring thousands or hundreds of people over here. The only thing that's preventing them from doing that are three things, three people. The man sitting on top of the elephant with a bullhook or an ankush piercing into the back of the head or the neck of the elephant. A man on the right of the elephant, below it standing next to him with a tall long spear poking into the side behind the ear. And a man on the other side of the elephant, again with a similar baton or a spear poking into the elephant. In addition to this, both the front legs and the hind legs of each of these bull elephants is hobbled sometimes with spiked anklets. And that is what is making these elephants stand for hours and hours in this huge milling crowded area. And that's the only way you can make a wild animal perform something that is so unnatural to it. It's completely unnatural for elephants to be standing this way in the wild bull elephants who achieve sexual maturity are pushed out of the herd very often by the matriarch and the other herd members because of the amount of aggression that they display. Now these are the sophisticated tools of training that are used to train elephants. You can see the spiked anklets. Each of those spikes is about two inches long and when it's tightened, it's embedded into the elephant. So you can imagine the pain that the elephant is going to constantly be in. Obviously the elephant's mind is going to be on the pain and not on trying to fight off its owner. So it'll cooperate with whoever is asking it to do anything that's unnatural. And then on the left, you see a bull hook, which is made of metal and then two spears, which are called ballams. And those are used to inflict injury and pain on the elephant. So it's pure fear, pain and intimidation that keeps these elephants trained and uh, cooperating with unnatural acts. In order to address this issue, Wildlife SOS as a team, we decided to try and create a solution, but a living, breathing solution that could be shown to people 
and encourage people to create similar solutions across India in every state. So we set up an elephant camp in Mathura, which is very close to the Taj Mahal. It's also called the Elephant Conservation and Care Center, which we established in 2010, about 10 years ago. We also um, established recently, about a couple of years ago, India's first elephant hospital. Uh, that's the blue uh, structure that you see. It's, it looks like a huge industrial uh, barn or a factory, but it's 12,000 square feet of pure medical facilities for elephants. And the vehicle that you see on the right is our elephant ambulance. Now I'll take you closer to the elephant ambulance and give you a, a down, download on what it contains and what's so special about the elephant ambulance. So this is India's first elephant ambulance. And what motivated us to go ahead and actually construct and build the specialized vehicle was Lakshmi, one of our elephants, who inspired us because she, when she was loaded into a truck to bring her back after she was rescued and confiscated by the forest department and handed over to Wildlife SOS, she was so mischievous she put a trunk out of the truck and into the driver's cabin and started blowing into the driver's ear. Of course, the driver got startled and almost toppled the truck. Then after that, she tried driving the truck by putting her trunk onto the wheel. And of course, that driver swore to never ever give an elephant a ride again. But it also taught us that experience gave us the understanding of what it is required to transport elephants carefully, smoothly, and safely. And that's why we went ahead and, and built this monument of an ambulance. Now let me walk you through what we have in the ambulance. Uh, inside The inside features of this is it's got a back door which keeps the elephant safe inside, but it's also solid and functions as a hydraulic ramp. So the door is something that the elephant can walk on once it is brought down on its hydraulics. We also have two crane-like structures that open out and stabilize the entire vehicle from shaking uh, because that's what elephants don't like when they want to get into an ambulance. They don't want to have a structure that's constantly shaking and shivering. They want to have a solid structure to get onto. We have shower nozzles inside the ambulance to keep the elephants cool so we can Give, keep, give them a wet shower as and when required on hot days. <coughs> we have food bins inside of the ambulance. There's a, a diesel generator, a portable generator that can supply electricity as and when required in case we have to camp somewhere and our team has to wait there for several days or several weeks while helping to rescue an elephant. We have a wet prep area and a, and a treatment area where our veterinarians can actually stay inside the ambulance. So can our elephant care staff and they can travel in the vehicle, also have bunk beds internally for the crew who are traveling in the ambulance. We have water storage, elephant access from the cabin so the veterinarian doesn't have to expose himself or herself to a, a strange elephant who could get unnerved if, they, if the elephant doesn't know them. So they can actually treat the elephant through certain bars which protects them from the elephant. And we have safety barriers as well within this. In addition, we have video cameras that uh, tell the crew inside what the elephant is doing and they can keep an eye on the elephant if it's you know in a situation where it's injuring itself or something, they can actually get in there and, and fix that. We have climate control uh, and observation windows in addition to all that. So I, I hope all of you will get a chance to visit our elephant hospital at some point of time and see the ambulance, get a tour of the ambulance yourself and see the hospital. But um, that gives you a, a brief summary of what the ambulance is all about. Now moving on to how we care for elephants in distress. Uh, the photo that you see here is our veterinarian assisted by a paravet and an elephant keeper providing treatment to elephants that are in our care at the Elephant Conservation and Care Center here in Mathura, India. Uh, we have extensive facilities here and our goal is to ensure 
that the elephants can get whatever is required. Anything that, that is needed, we make sure we try and get it for the elephants. And the photo on the left that you see is a crane. Uh, this is a F-15 crane, which has the capability to lift an elephant in distress and support it for as long as it's required by the veterinarians treating that elephant. And this crane has been quite a lifeline for us to help these elephants. And all of our equipment is donated by supporters, organizations, companies, and anybody who wants to make a difference, a permanent uh, impact on the lives of these elephants. The photo on the right is uh, the Jeep Wrangler that was donated to us by Jeep. And it helps, uh, it helps perform a very important role. Not only does our team uh, take this Jeep to uh, rescue animals, and we can find animals in places that are completely impossible for normal vehicles to go to because this is a, a four-wheel drive and can go off-roading really easily. But it also what you see in it are, are two veterinarians and they are monitoring the X-ray, the digital X-ray display, uh, which is a feed, a wireless feed from the X-ray unit that they would use. So they can carry the medical equipment to close to where the elephants are in these vehicles. So this is some of the facilities that we have inside our um, elephant hospital and at our elephant conservation and care center. In addition to this, what uh, you see here is that we, we do a lot of effort to make sure that we have the modern treatment facilities that is required. An elephant is not a dog. You can't pick it up and put it on a, on a table and examine it. You need to take the equipment to the elephant. And um, that's why we had to build this huge, huge facility by which we could support the elephants with the medical care that's required. And what you see on the left is one of our doctors, Dr. Rahul, who's uh, uh, diagnosing an X-ray of uh, the elephant. And on the right, you see one of our elephants receiving an X-ray, and that's Dr. Pramod taking the X-ray, and our elephant keepers and our paravets who are facilitating it. And these are very important um, medical facilities as well, a laser therapy machine. And this laser therapy machine has been such a godsend. Again, you know, thanks to our generous donors, we've been able to provide this equipment to uh, our team, our veterinary team, to be able to support the care of these elephants. And the photo on the left is one of our veterinarians administering laser therapy. And he has to wear glasses when he does that to protect his own eyes. But it makes a huge impact in the tissue healing uh, of the elephant and the wound healing of the elephants. The photo on the right is, uh, is a thermal imaging camera that is being used. A thermal imaging camera can actually help diagnose the wounds inside of the elephant and tell the vets which is the exact hot spot and the wound temperature inside the, uh, the, the area that is affected. That helps them plan their treatment and their diagnosis to much more accurately than uh, if they didn't have their equipment. Elephant foot care, again, is a very, very crucial part of our work. And as you know, elephants have delicate foot pads. They are, they are creatures of the forest. They're not used to walking on streets, hard tarmac, and uh, on hot, hot roads. But that's what they are subjected to when they get abused. And so here, what you're seeing is our veterinary team providing treatment. They have to remove cracks, uh, brush off the problem areas, and in some cases even pull out old pieces of metal, screws, pebbles, and things like that that have been embedded under the soft foot pad. And in some cases, when there are cracks that are going to sp split up and cause further problems, they have to even smoothen them out using equipment that's, uh, that's necessary in this particular case. And here's uh, some, one of our elephants that's cooperating beautifully as you can see, we use something called positive reinforcement, uh, and it's, it's combined with protected contact mechanism by which our elephants are uh, given a treat, and they associate every behavior that we request of them, like giving us a foot, giving us a trunk, allowing us to give medical interventions such as an injection or, or other medicines, 
we want them to associate every bit of that with a positive experience. And so what we do is we give them treats, whether it's peanuts, dates, you know, anything that they like. And it could include biscuits, it could include sugarcane chunks. And they absolutely love it. And in some cases, even if we have done with that foot, I mean, they keep showing us the same foot because they, they want those treats basically. But here what you see is one of our vets rasping and smoothening out uh, irregular surface under the foot pad. And this is the essential and regular maintenance that is required to keep elephants in good health. Another really important aspect of the care that we provide to elephants at the Elephant Conservation and Care Center is enrichment. It's called enclosure enrichment and it is absolutely essential to make their lives more fun. Imagine if you had to live all your lives uh, in, in an enclosure or in a facility and you didn't have the freedom to go anywhere as you would have if you were a wild elephant. Sadly, these elephants can't be put back in the wild because they're all in distress conditions, require a lot of medical care and constant treatment. But here what you see on the left is overhead feeding nets and overhead feeding clumps. So we try to challenge the elephants with various uh, simulations similar to what they would find in the forest. So in the forest, they would have to reach up and pull branches off from above. They'd have to you know, push trunk, tree trunks over in order to access you know, fresh branches or the sap uh, and, and uh, other areas of the trees. So we try and create similar situations so they can be challenged to find their food. This is called enrichment. And we see that the elephants thoroughly enjoy it. Here you can see one of our elephants on the right who's busy, you know, and she, you can see she's closed her eyes and is pushing um, the trunk over, the tree trunk over, which is embedded quite deep in the enclosure. And this, these are called overhead hay nets that we hang where the idea is that the elephant takes a long time to pull that fodder out and it, it engages them and keeps them occupied mentally, psychologically, as well as physically. And on the right here, you see uh, Suraj busy with his uh, pool. He's enjoying himself and he's decided to wear his, uh, his toy, uh, his pool toy on his head like a little hat. The important thing that we offer elephants at the Elephant Conservation and Care Center is a chance to be social. Elephants are social animals, and sadly, once they come into captivity, they do not get that opportunity again, and they live in solitary splendor. So here, we give them a chance to make friends, to get to know other elephants, and they make social herds. And that's an important part of elephant ecology, and we are delighted that we can help them with that support. Here are a few examples of before and after images that I'd like to share. This is Raju, all of, all of you probably know Raju, the crying elephant. And this was the day that he was rescued by our team. And uh, this is how he looks today. So uh, before I go on further, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what goes into a rescue operation. You know, sometimes people think it's very easy, but I can tell you that it's a huge challenge to organize and run uh, a rescue operation. So this is an elephant in need. Suraj elephant um, is the name, uh, name of this elephant. And he was in a temple in Maharashtra. And the forest department contacted us and wanted us to move this elephant from this location and take him to the Elephant Conservation and Care Center for treatment. Uh, this is where we had to do an assessment of the elephant. You can see our team doing the assessment. Following that, we then have to work with the local community, the forest uh, officers, the forest department, the district administration, etc. And sometimes elephant rescues can get very, very complicated. And here's another example I'm going to give you. Uh, this is another elephant that was owned by a queen in India, and she contacted the forest department, wanted to hand the elephant over to us. Unfortunately, the local community over there did not understand the needs of an elephant and they were emotionally connected to the elephant, did not want the elephant to, to be moved from there. So we were faced with a huge challenge 
uh, where people, the local community, did not want us to move the elephant, but the forest department wanted the elephant moved out of that location. And that's when things get very complicated. Could you, could you all please mute your mics? This is a ho housekeeping request. If everybody could keep their mics muted and their videos mute or switched off, we will finish the presentation in about 10 minutes and then we can open up for Q&A, please. Thank you. And now, uh, once the elephant is inside the ambulance, Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, please let me know if you can't hear me. Once the elephant is loaded inside the ambulance, that's when we start providing treatment immediately. Uh, and the next step is to make sure that we can give the elephant the food that it's been deprived of for several years. So we start off by making it a very positive experience for the elephant by giving them the fruits that they've never had an opportunity to taste in the past because most of these elephants that have been on the street begging and giving tourist rides have lived a fairly malnourished life with poor levels of nutrition. And of course, no journey is complete in India when you drive around, you know, without a stop. And we have, we have to make many, many stops on the way. And of course, the elephants and our staff get a chance to get off the truck, take a break and stretch their legs. One of the important things um, we also work on is conflict mitigation. And uh, what you see here is uh, on the, the photo on the right shows you a GPS radio collar that we install on wild elephants that are involved in conflict situations where we get reports of human elephant conflict. And the photo that you see on the left is our team installing this radio collar on an elephant. And the way to do that is not easy, I can, ch I can tell you that, because it, you can't just go, hello, kitty, 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 come here, and the elephant is not gonna come to you. Our team has to follow the elephant for elephant herd for weeks and weeks and weeks. In fact, our team, Dr. Arun, Dr. Elia Raja, and their committed, dedicated team of uh, elephant trackers, paravets, and staff, were out in the field for many, many weeks tracking this herd. And this is uh, specifically in, a, in the central Indian state of Chhattisgarh, where we were invited by the forest department to come in and help them uh, address and assist them with a human elephant conflict mitigation issue. And um, so once we tracked this elephant, they then had to find a day when the matriarch was more relaxed and she was visible in the deep forest and they were able to dart her with a specially calibrated dose of sedative which would achieve standing sedation. You can see that the elephant over there is standing but she is tranquilized. She, but she's not sedated enough to fall over but it's just the right level of dosage that keeps her standing. And that's when you blindfold her so you prevent further simulation by light and noises and you keep very quiet. Our team then was able to install the radio collar on her. And this radio collar then gives us tracking ability and our team can actually receive global positioning, uh, satellite positioning messages with exact locations of that herd because the matriarch is followed by the herd and leads the herd around. And they were able to alert the forest department and the local communities through text messaging and WhatsApp and also the forest department had a very good system about announcing these locations on radio as well through the local radio channels. And the local communities are then alerted to the movement of the elephant herd in their direction. They can then come out, bring their pots and pans, make some noise, etc., and stop the elephant herd, discourage them from coming closer to their agricultural fields or their homes. So that is how human elephant conflict can be mitigated using technology and awareness. But parallel to this is something that we have to do. Our team goes to every village and make sure that we engage with the local community, explain to them what ecological value 
role that these elephants play, but also how avoidance behavior can be achieved by knowing about how to behave when elephants are approaching your village, how to stay out of trouble, and how you can easily prevent conflict by alerting the elephants to your presence. And this is how we've been able to successfully create a, a good mechanism over here. I'd like to make a request. There are a few people raising their hands. I would request that you please type your uh, questions or your comments in the chat box. So when the presentation is over, we will then be able to address your questions and your comments. Thank you. So the goal of Wildlife SOS to en is to ensure a better life for all elephants. But at the same time, you know, I'd like to answer a question that some of you might be asking, you know, what's the connection between captive elephants and wild elephants? How does rescuing a captive elephant help all of Indian, Indian elephants? It's really important for all of you to understand that captive elephants come from the wild. Very few captive elephants, a minuscule number are born in captivity. Most of them come from the wild. And I'll, I'll explain to you how, how it helps. Uh, here's, here's a little bit about the laws in India that protect elephants. You know, today's topic is about protecting elephants in India, and this is what we are going to speak about. So, as all of you might already know, uh, the Asian elephant is listed under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of India. Now, uh, I don't know if, if all of you know this, but India has one of the best and the, and the most uh, progressive laws for protection of wildlife anywhere in the world. And a lot of countries actually admire the, the laws, the progressive laws that India has, has established in 1972. So if a man is convicted or a person is convicted for illegal possession of wildlife and that animal is listed under Schedule 1 or Part 2 of Schedule 2, then you could be jailed for up to seven years and this is a non-bailable and non-compoundable offense. And in addition to this, you might also have to pay a fine. So it's really important for us to understand that India has excellent laws, but it needs all of us to support and help and assist to make sure that the law enforcement can also go hand in hand. Section 51 of the Wildlife Protection Act um, lays down the details of the penalty, which cannot be less than three years and can go up to seven years. Uh, and of course, you know, all hunting and poaching is, is seen as poaching in India and all hunting is strictly prohibited under the Wildlife Protection Act. And an elephant can only be owned or kept in someone's possession if they have valid ownership documentation or an ownership certificate issued by the chief wildlife warden of that state. So we have great laws, like I said, um, it's, it requires of more support and more attention in terms of the implementation. Now, how, how does it help law enforcement if re elephants are rescued and, and rescue centers or elephant camps are established around India? Here's, here's why I, I'd like to explain this. These are some facts about illegal elephant trafficking. Most captive, captive elephants, like I explained to you, are taken from the wild, but a large number of elephants which are owned also don't have valid documentation. Enforcement of laws is required to curb elephant trafficking. And as you know, probably, illegal wildlife trafficking is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's very lucrative and it requires every bit of support. And all of us can together support and help prevent illegal trafficking of wildlife, including elephants. If the forest department confiscates an elephant or the police help arrest a trafficker and they confiscate an elephant, very often there are not enough places across India to house these elephants. It becomes a challenge, it becomes a pressure. The zoos don't necessarily have abundance of space and that can be a challenge. That's where facilities like the elephant camp in Mathura and other places that the forest department is establishing um, will play an important role. If an elephant is confiscated, they then can house that elephant over there. That's why, that's one of the main reasons that we established the Elephant Conservation and Care Center in collaboration with the Uttar Pradesh Forest Department in Mathura. As you will agree, elephant, uh, elephant protection can be achieved much more efficiently if there is strong uh, enforcement of laws, which will function as a deterrent 
to elephant trafficking. Lastly, I'd like to very briefly mention the campaign that Wildlife SOS has been running for a while called Refuse to Ride. And I'd urge all of you to please go to refusetoride.org and take a look at the website. It's just a resource website, which will give you a lot of information. And I believe that information and knowledge is power. Once you know that information, then it will help you. Each of you can be an ambassador for the elephants. Each of you can help protect elephants. You can help alert the authorities and also inform Wildlife SOS if you see an elephant in distress and you can be in, empowered with this information. So what we are requesting is that people be aware, tourists, please be aware of what it takes for that elephant to give you a ride. It might be a few minutes of fun for a tourist, but it's a, it's a lifetime of misery and abuse uh, and pain and agony for that elephant. So please think about it, look at the situation, understand your facts, and then please take the right decision. I hope uh, that's what you do. So Refuse to Ride is a public education campaign about elephant rights um, you know, that, that we are trying to put out and we'd like everybody's help. And I'd request all of you to please read it and also share it on your social media channels and with your friends. Um, just one last shout out again um, to the Nat Geo Wild series that's up there. And if any of you want to know more about the work of Wildlife SOS and see and witness for yourself what kind of rescue operations we do, whether it's elephants, crocodiles, tigers, leopards, bears, you can see all of this on the Nat Geo Wild series, India's Jungle Heroes. So please uh, don't hesitate to take a look at that when you get a chance. Thank you again for joining us today and thank you for your help to protect elephants. Once again, I'd like to mention and acknowledge the support that we've had from Nat Geo Wild and the association with Jeep. Thank you all for joining us. I'm now going to open up for questions and I would request our uh, mediators to help us uh, get these questions channeled. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, we've got a couple of questions. We've been answering on the chat box as well, but the first one I'd like to ask you is, um, is it le uh, legal to capture and train elephants from the wild for temples? How can we fight it? So you've just covered this, but if you can repeat it briefly. Sure. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, no capturing uh, of elephants is permitted unless the chief wildlife warden of a state specifically, um, you know, wants that elephant captured because it's a rogue or, you know, it's causing a lot of destruction or it's killed a lot of people. There is usually a very specific requirement. Otherwise, it's not, it's not legal at all. Okay, thank you. Um so now, uh, how has the elephant population been performing in the recent years? Is it still in decline? The elephant population certainly is in decline. There may be more instances of elephants being seen, but that's because the habitat is getting thinner, the forests are getting more degraded, human habitation is moving closer to uh, you know, elephant habitats, and that is causing a higher level of conflict and a higher level of visibility Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is, what happens to the mahouts and the keepers when you rescue the elephants? We believe very strongly in, in working with people and we always invite the mahout and the keeper to join us and work with us and provide, continue to provide care for that elephant. In some cases, because they don't want to move from away from their family or something, they don't. But in most cases, we invite them to come with us as well. And they're all working with us and they, uh, we, we offer them free medical support. We offer them medical insurance, life insurance, uh, and uh, food, clothing, lodging. So we try and give them a high quality of life if they come and want to help us look after the elephants in our care. Okay, uh, interesting question. What are the signs and symptoms that will give us a clue that an elephant is under abuse? 
this is a probably a long question better to be done offline but you know if you have your email address you can send it to us and we can send you we'll create an advisory in fact we are working uh, with the responsible tourism society of india as well to create proper channels uh, and make sure that people can understand that but if you see an elephant that's in you know in in bad shape it's limping it's it's blind the eyes are watering you can see discharge uh, and the the man sitting next to the elephant is having to yell constantly or beat it or whack it i think all these are signs that the elephant is constantly being abused also stereotypic behavior so we will put together it there several things that that are needed uh, but um, stereotypic behavior is you know the head bobbing and weaving if a elephant is showing signs of distress constantly then you know that uh, you know it's it's being held in 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 very bad conditions so uh, you know in most cases i think people don't know so we have in the past tried to approach you know temples or other places where you know if the tel- temple has land or the place has land we even offered to help them design a facility that they can hold the elephant in a much better condition and some people have come forward with those ideas but some take longer but all it requires is a willingness to help change the life of that elephant it does not require anything else to make a difference to an elephant that is already in bad condition in some place all it requires is someone over there in charge being willing and open to making a change okay thank you um when and where did you rescue your first elephant oh we rescued our first elephant uh, in uttar pradesh uh, in 2010 all right um uh, one second is there any way a student can contribute to conservation of wildlife of course uh, step 1 the student can be an ambassador uh, learn learn about elephants please go to wildlifeservice.org and familiarize yourself with our various projects learn more about elephant care and get involved by going to refuse to ride.org and then share it you know organize a workshop with your school we'd be more than happy to do a webinar with your school and help spread the word i think that can make a huge difference you know like i said public awareness is everything we've got to educate people around us and that will change the future for elephants Thank you. Um, do elephants live longer in the wild or in captivity? Well, it depends on the level of care. They live a very um, challenged life in captivity. They do not get. You can see wild elephants do not have pigmentation on their on their bodies on their faces, whereas captivity brings a lot of pigmentation to th- to these animals because they do not get access to the kind of vegetation that they would get in the wild. and uh, that that can only happen unfortunately in in captivity that pigmentation so they have a much better quality of life and if they don't have too much of competition for food in the forest if the forest quality is good then they can have great long lives in the forest as well but they might have longer uh, longer lives in captivity but what is the quality of life even if it's longer you know is it a great quality of life i would think not um can a disease get transformed from elephants to humans and vice versa due to increased interaction i know that people can give tuberculosis to elephants surely uh, and this is called reverse zoonosis human beings who are sick can transmit diseases to elephants and there are also cases where um, elephants could transmit diseases and they have been tested positive for tuberculosis i think that's one of the things that you know tourists have to also be careful about when they get on top of elephants and ride them uh, but there's a lot of research that's going on at the moment and we don't have enough data to share but uh, if all of you can please go to wildlifeservice.org and subscribe to our newsletter then we will make sure that you will all uh, get updates regular updates uh, from us also when you have a chance please go to our youtube channel and subscribe so that you can stay connected with us and we can keep giving you information on what's going on okay thank you um how are elephants that are in need found if they don't have a tracker tracker i i don't understand that question uh, completely so how how do we how do you track the elephants that are in need and go rescue them 
is what oh is. yes certainly so once we get information and it's all people like yourselves you know people like yourselves see or learn about an elephant in distress and you would somebody would report it to us and uh, we have a hotline mahima could maybe type in the elephant hotline onto the chat box uh, so people can report the elephant to that number by text sms or by whatsapp or by a call and give us the location and then very often we send informers who are go undercover and gather intelligence about those elephants and then once we confirm the information then we speak with the forest department and the police authorities to intervene and if it's uh, if it's a legit case and it really requires intervention then that's when uh, our teams will go in along with the forest department or the police authorities a uh, last couple of questions um can photography contribute towards conservation of wildlife of course photography can contribute to uh, to conservation of wildlife by making sure you can capture moments that everybody can't see you know everybody doesn't get a ch get a chance to see an elephant having a dust bath people don't get a chance to see an elephant in a river swimming across a river you know all of us have probably seen images of elephants swimming in the sea you know in the andaman nicobar islands but you know how many of us has have had a chance to actually witness that but that's what photographers are for they have the unique opportunity to be able to witness this capture those images and those memories and help us spread awareness so we would invite photographers to come forward and contribute images to us and uh, and please be a part of our team help us document um, elephants both in captivity like for example you know photographers can not just uh, document photos of wild elephants to help spread awareness but also uh, help us document you know rescue operations medical procedures and you know report abuse or illegal uh, trafficking of elephants if they can document it but please connect with us and and stay connected that will help us uh, take this forward um how many more elephants can wildlife sos rescue wildlife sos is not in the business of collecting elephants we are not trying to hoard elephants that's not our goal our goal is to only try and create a mechanism by which we can show a living breathing model of how elephants can be cared for in a humane manner so we probably don't want to hold more than maybe 50 elephants that's probably going to be the top cap for us but the goal is to try and emulate this model across the country in collaboration with state forest departments and other agencies that are interested in doing this okay um how can we prevent the growing numbers of man animal uh, man elephant conflicts I think a uh, human elephant conflict can only be curbed one with education so people understand what causes it and it's invariably always a high level of intolerance from human beings because elephants don't like us they don't want to be near us they want to avoid us and stay deep in the forest but what happens is human beings unfortunately encroach the forest we put our fields right next to the forest we also want to build our villages expand our our uh, agriculture our urbanization right next to their habitats and very often we are blocking their uh, their paths and the corridors of these elephants have been used by herds for generations and suddenly when they come and they find that you know it's been blocked because a factory has been built on it or a village has come up on it that's when conflicts happen it's very easy to understand conflict and avoid it but it just requires human beings to be more understanding to be more tolerant and patient okay um how do you approach a wild elephant which is injured and in need but scared and frightened it might be blind or hurt a blind elephant did you say could you repeat that please oh. how do you approach a wild elephant which is injured and in need but might be scared or frightened or hurt well the best way to ad address that kind of situation would be to involve the forest department and have them come and assess the elephant you might need to tranquilize it 
to to get standing sedation so that a veterinarian can go close to the elephant and examine it and see what the nature of the wound is or if it's blind if it's bilaterally blind etc many of these animals have uh, immense capability to adapt and learn because if it's an injury that has occurred from a fight with another elephant or a tree branch falling on it or something um, you know they can recoup and recover with just a little bit of intervention they don't need too much of intervention it's only when the problem has been created by human beings like you know we if there's been an accident with a truck or a vehicle and that has left the elephant injured or it's fallen into a ditch that we have uh, you know dug or something like that that's when the the problem you know requires a larger level of uh, medical intervention i hope that answers the question mm -hmm. um are captive elephants that are rescued let out in the wild later so basically the elephants that we rescue do we release them back in the wild we would love to release these elephants back in the wild but like i explained during the webinar presentation most of the elephants that come to us are in extremely bad shape requiring long term medical care they are blind lame uh, arthritic or on the verge of death that's when they come to us and then we have to nurse them pretty much all their lives so sadly these are not elephants that can be uh, certified fit to be released back in the wild but if we ever find elephants that are fit to be released in the wild we would do that in collaboration with the forest department and with the permission of the authorities okay so um last question how has your work continued during the pandemic have you had to make changes to your approaches of course the pandemic has impacted all of us uh, but thankfully we have had such an incredibly dedicated team that the team just stayed put with us you know instead of getting scared because of the pandemic they stayed with us we followed store social distancing we had to invest extensively in medical equipment and protective gear pp suits and things like that for our staff but while ensuring that we could continue to provide food medical support and care for our elephants it was a challenge all through the pandemic and it continues to be so Uh, to administer food supplies medical supplies and things like that but i think some of our supporters and donors have been extremely generous and they've come forward and and helped us with uh, resolving the situation during the pandemic but we're always looking for more support and so i would encourage each and every one of you to please consider becoming a monthly supporter of wildlife festivals if you feel this is the work that you want to continue to support and thank you for that that's it so uh, anyone's questions that we've missed out we will be emailing you the answers um yes and and you all have our email address it's info@wildlifesos.org if you don't have uh, uh, in the information yet uh, Sh shrina please type that in and then if anybody needs any answers or you feel we couldn't address your question please send an email and we will try our best to get back to you as quickly as possible thank you again everybody for joining us today on world elephant day and it was a pleasure to interact with all of you thank you again and i hope to see you again soon bye bye